This is Nate Tomeo of the Memory Palace Podcast. I am currently the artist in residence at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This episode is one of 10 stories that I'll be producing for and about the Met. Some of these stories from the residency will be hard to follow or uh, properly experience if you're not at the museum. I think this one works. It will, however, make more sense if you take a look at the painting discussed within it. Find it in the show notes on my website, thememorypalace.org, or on your podcast app. Alternatively, you can look it up at metmuseum.org. It is the portrait of William Duguid, spelled D-U-G-U-I-D. That is D-U-G-U-I-D. All of that said, in a perfect world, you would listen to this piece while standing in front of the painting. It is located in Gallery 747 in the Met's American Wing. This is the Memory Palace. I'm Nate DeMeo. It was the flowers in the wending vine, green on white, that caught her eye. Amelia Peck was pulling together an exhibition for the Met about how global trade sent ideas about art and beauty around the world between 1500 and 1800. She's a curator of textiles and decorative arts at the museum. And she was at this antique show downtown. This was a few years ago. Kind of went on a whim to see what was what and catch up with some friends. And she found herself walking through this big convention space, wandering through the warrens of temporary booths filled with American antiques. Just sideboard after sideboard after sideboard. Little oil still life of a fruit bowl after little oil still life of a fruit bowl. And on and on. When she saw this painting, this one here, or more precisely, she saw the clothes in this painting, worn by this rather dashing man, the white dressing gown with the green vine and the pink and white flowers. Now, Amelia's not an expert in portraits. It's not her area. But she knows enough to know that this was probably done in New England, somewhere in the mid to late 18th century. She recognized the look, with their improbable anatomies, the two large heads, the unusable hands. Portraits made by untrained artists who were reaching for something true, and sometimes finding it. Even if you can't quite find where an arm is supposed to connect to a shoulder beneath a poofy shirt. And Amelia liked this particular painting, thought it had life in it, and a certain charm. But mostly she liked how it fit so perfectly into her textile show, like the story it helped tell about global trade, like how seeing this white colonist in his Asian-inspired clothes opened up the world of colonial New England a bit, beyond the tricorn hats and brown breeches, and poked a little hole in our common understanding of the past to let a different kind of light in. And the painting went up in the textile show, as an accent, as almost an afterthought. And then Amelia got an email. A woman named Paula Bagger, a lawyer and an amateur historian, had been looking for a painting just like this one for years. Something that would help prove her theory about two small portraits in the modest collection of the Historical Society of Hingham, Massachusetts. One of a man, done in the same folky style as this one here. The other, a copy of a portrait of a woman named Christian Barnes, by John Singleton Copley, the Boston painter of the era. And so to stumble upon this painting, just poking around on the Met's website, and to learn that it had been signed on the wood in the back, by the very man she'd been trying to prove had painted the other paintings? She couldn't believe her luck, and she needed to let the Met know what they had on their hands. The three portraits, the two in the Hingham Historical Society, just across the street from a t-shirt shop and a nail salon, and this one here at the Met, just there, just a step away from where you might be standing now, are the only existing paintings, the only existing fine art, full stop, made by a slave in colonial America. And so Paula Bagger, Amelia Peck, and the conservators at the Met went to work. They used magnifying glasses and x-rays and infrared reflectography to prove that all three paintings were by the same person. They used family records and old ads in colonial newspapers to learn about the subject of the Met's portrait, William Duguid, and how he was a Bostonian and a Scottish immigrant, and how he imported textiles. And they were able to place him in the circle of the two subjects of the Hingham portraits, Henry Barnes and his wife Christian. And there were letters, many letters, from the Barnes family. And some tell pieces of the story of the life of the artist. Of how the Barnes purchased him in 1769, 
The Barnes already owned his mother, Daphne. He was 28 at the time. They know that from church records of his baptism. Mrs. Barnes' letters speak of her slave, Prince Demma Barnes, and his genius at painting, and how that genius shocked her and delighted her. What a queer thing that this slave, this man who was, of course, less than a man, had an aptitude for capturing faces. It wasn't just her, she wrote to a friend. Other people had looked at the drawings and paintings and thought them to be very well done. She seemed to get a kick out of that. And Prince Demma Barnes, a man whose name points both toward West Africa and to the global trade that brought him to Boston like a dressing gown wound with flowering vines, became the pet project, the hobby, the parlor trick of the Lady Barnes. She wrote to friends asking for advice for ways to encourage her Negro slave, to properly equip him with crayons and canvas. We know from the letters and the x-rays, the reflectography, that Prince Demma Barnes had learned to paint, in part by copying Copley's, though we don't know how or when he saw them, beyond the one of Mrs. Barnes. Researchers suppose that he may have been allowed by the family's friends, Copley's subjects themselves, to come by their houses and take a look at their own Copley portraits and learn what he could. Or maybe he'd sketch the paintings while his master was off taking tea, talking business in other rooms in their houses, drinking in all he could about form and shading and brushwork in whatever time he had with the paintings before his master called him away to cater to some fleeting need. They learned from these letters that the Barnes thought enough of Prince's talents to send him to London to study. And that fact surely says something about their treatment of their slave, about the relative comfort of the life they deigned to allow him to live. But those letters speak too of how the Barnes kept Prince from talking to other black people while in London, where slavery was illegal, because he was there to learn about painting, not about freedom. And we know from an ad placed in a Boston paper in 1773 that Prince Demma Barnes was set up with a studio of some sort, in a watchmaker's shop, where people could come to get cut-rate portraits, and that he may have worked there for a year or two. We're not sure. The historical record loses track of him, and leaves us to wonder what exactly happened when the revolution came to Boston, when the Barnes, who were loyalists, skipped town for London, and left Prince behind, like he left their name behind, when he enlisted in the Continental Army in 1777 and signed his name Prince Demma. We know that he died a year later. Some clues point to smallpox. There is a record of his burial at a church. It says Prince Demma, a free Negro. But there is nothing that tells us about that period right before the revolution, when he painted portraits in a watchmaker's shop. No evidence except for this painting here. And what does it tell us about this man and what he may have thought about the people who came to sit for him, about what they thought of him? We can stare at this portrait, stare at it all day, stare at this Bostonian who came from Scotland of his own free will and made enough of his own life to be sitting there in a dressing gown with flowers on a wending vine that he may well have brought from the other side of the world. We can search his blue-gray eyes, but we can only wonder what the artist is trying to capture in them. Amusement? Impatience? Discomfort? Wonder? We can never know. And we can never know the man they're seeing. This episode is written and produced by me, Nate DeMeo, of the Memory Palace podcast, with research assistance from Andrea Milne and engineering assistance from Alyssa Dudley. It is executive produced by Lamore Tomer, who heads up Met Live Arts at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. My residency is made possible by the Metropolitan Museum of Art's Chester Dale Fund. The Memory Palace is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, which receives support from the Knight Foundation, MailChimp, 
at Zerk and from its generous listeners. To learn more about The Memory Palace, go to thememorypalace.org and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Radiotopia.